wanted to take a little bit of time and talk about the questions and the FRQs from Unit 1. So the first thing we're going to look at is how to create a histogram. Uh, this is really simple. Uh, they really did a good job of just setting you up over here with giving you the intervals here and then the, the frequencies, which essentially is the height of your bars, right? So I'm gonna go through here and kind of pick out the different values. So each of these things over here is gonna get a single bar over on this side. So we're gonna create the age, of course, in years. And I'm gonna make sure, I'm not gonna put, obviously these, you see it has two values, but it's 20 to 30 to 40 to 50, and then all the way up to 80. So we create the, the units on the x-axis first, and then we're gonna go up top on the, on the y-axis. Uh, when you're creating a histogram, it's important that you label your axes with values, and you label it with your actual number or your whatever the units are. In this case, is age. Uh, most often, when you write out a histogram, the y-axis is most often called a frequency. It could also be re, uh, re represented as count, but because they've given you this situation where you can read it, let's just kind of stick with what they wrote down. Once you've got the axes set up, uh, we can go back over here it can we can just pick out the frequencies and Obviously I went up by 20s. So in some of these examples, I'm gonna have to estimate like for 115 125 and 135 we'll have to kind of get close But I think for the most part as long as you're doing a good job and Representing those things appropriately. They're not gonna really knock you for a little minor miscalculation or where it looks like it's almost something so I'm using um, I'm using, I'm just basically making each bar, so it starts on 20 and it goes up to 30, and I'm creating the bars based on these heights over here. So we're gonna create each one for each of these sections. Remember, when I'm done, um, it, it's not always required to write your title, but I went ahead and, and, and titled mine. I just kinda went back and said, what was this really talking about? It was really talking about a distribution of ages um, at the resort, so uh, I just called it distribution of ages, which is totally fine. Um, I, in, the, in the key, it doesn't even mention talking about the title. And that's the first part, okay? So the second part, uh, a little bit more involved, right? They didn't give you as much free stuff um, in this example. But it says right here, and this is the important part, it says write a few sentences to describe the distribution. All right, let's go way back way back into chapter four and five, right? In this example, we're gonna talk about shape, centered spread. All right, so first off, shape is essentially the distribution, um, the way it looks, right? You can kind of remember how, what the picture looks like. It was not symmetric, or no, sorry, it was not unimodal and, and bell-shaped. It was roughly symmetrical, and I use rough very, very, roughly here. Um, I would even say, uh, if you're going to call it roughly symmetric, it's probably even um, somewhat some uniform in distribution, where the heights are similar heights. Um, I don't know if I'd call this bimodal. I really would stay away from that word um, because you don't really see two different peaks as much as it's almost kind of flat across the top. The center, in, other, in, in this example, we're really going to have to kind of figure this out. Um, one of the ways you can find center, uh, well, let's just kind of identify first. The, the, I'm going to go with the median value here because I can't really calculate mean. I don't know the actual values, but I do know the number of values within certain ranges. And we can determine that the median value is definitely going to be, I believe it was between, what, 40 and 50, I think the age groups of 40, 50. Something I, I left out in, in shape and center was the description of or the context. So make sure that you continue to, re, re, to put context into it. Um, how did I find the median value and how did I know that I was finding it? Number one, the median value is absolutely the 50th percentile. So I'm gonna add up the number of people that we have in this group and that's 765. Well, if I'd like to know where the 50th person falls, well, I'm gonna divide this by two, or I could multiply by 0.5, it doesn't really matter. We know that the median is the 50th percentile, so when we do this, we're gonna get 380 
2.5. So I'm looking for where in, in what group up here does a 382nd or 383rd person fall. If I can determine uh, that, I'm just going to basically add up the sections until I break over 383. Once I find that value, that's going to say, oh, well, that's the age group that you would have found the median value in. And so if we look at it, uh, you can you can add up the different values. So really, it's going to be the first 160 plus 130 plus 100. And at that point, you will realize that you, you broke over that value, right? And so once you've added those three together, that puts you over, uh, I think it's 390 at that point. So you'd know that in that third category, which is the 40 to 50 age group, then that would be where you would fall into it. Okay, next part would be spread. Spread is kind of the easy part. Um, remember, you're doing what you can to figure this out. You're not making any kind of assumptions or, or guessing at anything. We know that the minimum occurs between 20 and 30, right down here, our smallest range, and the maximum is gonna occur up here in the 70 to 80 range. So if I subtract like the closest values there and the farthest values, right, we could subtract the 70 and the 30 to get a 40 if they were as close as possible, or I could take the largest one, 80 and 20, and subtract those two, and that would give me a rough estimate that my range could be as large as 60 or as small as 40, All right? All right, we took 70 minus 30 as the small, as the closest two values between the ranges, and we took 80 and 20 as the values, um, as the largest values that we could have. So any, essentially, the range would be between 20 and 40 years. And that's part B. Remember, shapes and spread. In order to get full contact or full uh, full marks on part B, you had to talk about shapes and spread, and you had to talk about it in context. Okay, part C. Um, does the data provide convincing evidence that surveyed ages come from a normal distribution? Explain your answer. And you had a number of resources to say. I think the easiest one would be shape, and that's kind of what I focused on. The data does not suggest that the data, the data, uh, comes from a normal distribution. We know that normal distributions are unimodal and bell-shaped or mound-shaped, and we know that this graph does not have that kind of shape. And there's a lot of things I could talk about. Um, you could have gotten really detailed with this, and you could have brought up the 68, 95, 99.7 rule and talked about how that those percentages didn't work out, or you could have talked about um, towards the end of your values, you had more data than you did in the middle. And we know that normal distributions have that peak in the middle where majority of your data falls. In order to get full credit for this one, you had to talk about the fact that the data, um, the, you had to mention that it definitely doesn't suggest that it's normal, and you had to give a, a logical explanation. Um, discussing the shape or discussing the different percentages or the fact that it's the majority of the data is outside of it, you had to give some kind of clearly defined answer to why that was the way it was. And that would be it. To go back to the beginning one, if you, in order to get full credit for the graph, you had to, to label the axes, you had to get the graph right, um, and you had to, to put the words down exactly how it worked, or the labels for the axes. Question two. This one, well, I think this one's pretty straightforward. This is definitely coming back into chapter five and six. We're hitting up the z-score concept. Uh, I think the part A was a, was a super easy task. It just simply wanted me to find the z-scores for two values given two different distributions. And so I wrote the z-score formula down, x minus the mean divided by the standard deviation. And uh, you can see that right here. And then I'm going to calculate the north uh, z-score, which would be 13 minus 10 divided by 3, which was really easy. That's 1. If I bring down the, the southern data, we've got a approximately normal with a mean of 16 and a standard deviation of 2.5. So that's going to plug in here. So here again, we're dealing with a 13 ounce bird. So 13 minus 16 divided by 2.5. And that's going to give me a negative, I believe it's negative 1.2. 
Uh, so slightly farther away, but this time it's below the main. And so that's part A. If you if you showed your work and got the correct Z scores, essentially correct on that one. This one's a little bit more involved. It wanted to know, is it more likely that a bird of this type with a weight of greater than 13 ounces lives in the northern region or the southern region? Justify your answer. N keyword there, is it more likely? So I need a probability. What's the probability that it came from the north or from the south if you just found it outside? This is where normal CDF comes into play. Uh, normal CDF with a lower upper mean and standard deviation. Notice I defined it here. I'm not gonna put numbers in and not define what those sim what those values are. And so avoid calculator speak. When you do it and you don't tell what the inputs are, uh, you can definitely lose your score sometime just because you typed in the numbers and didn't define it. So at least at one point define what they are. You can either do it like I've done it here or I can write it out beside it and then just plug it in like this. So it turns out that there's a 16% chance or almost 16% chance that the bird was from the north. Let's do that for the southern region. I'm gonna change the mean here to 16 and we're still doing 13 or more because it's talking about here greater than 13 ounces. That was the idea of where I'm gonna shade my curve. I'm going to bring this same concept. I'm not going to redefine it because I've already done it once here, so no point doing it that way. I'm just going to type in those numbers. This time it'll be 13 and up again, just like before, but this time we're going to do 10 and 3 as a mean and a standard deviation. And at this point, whichever probability is larger, then that's the likelihood that the bird came from that section. Okay, so turns out that uh, I think we had a really good idea just from looking at the picture that it's a lot more like, in fact, I'm not even sure that you really needed to do all of this because it's such a bigger, you'd have to explain why you knew that, but 88% um, chance that it came from the Southern region. So I'm gonna make a statement about what I understand from my pictures and I absolutely would bring these pictures in. I would not just put that, I've got the picture, I've got this, and I've got my actual results. I think that's all really crucial to make sure you get the right, uh, or get full credit. The bird is much more likely to come from the south. Obviously, 88% is a lot more than 16%. To get full credit from this, you had to either refer back to the z-scores, and that was what I was saying, you could have referred to this kind of idea, and talked about how far away something is, and then it's more than that. You'd have had to refer to that uh, using the z-scores from up top and then these pictures. But we decided to go around the different way and talk about probability. I think that's a little clearer. We found those probabilities, we defined our normal CDF, and then we made a contextual conclusion uh, using what we found in the two results. I think that was a pretty easy one. Hope that helped.